Hi, everyone. Welcome to Having Children After Cancer with Dr. Diana Chapkin. We're going to get started in just a moment. Please let us know if uh, you're having any difficulty hearing or seeing the screen. And you can do that by just sending me a message or in the question pane. So we're just going to give people a couple more minutes to sign on. And then we're going to get started. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So again, welcome to Having Children After Cancer with Dr. Diana Chapkin. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. And just before the presentation begins, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about SHARE. That we are a nonprofit organization that helps people through breast or ovarian cancer, offering the unique support of survivors who've been there. Our services are free of charge and include helplines, support groups, educational programs, and public health initiatives. For more information, you can always check out our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. So let me tell you a little bit about the format of the program and how you can participate. So we'll start the program with Dr. Chapkin's presentation and ask that people that are here in the, in the room with us um, to hold your questions and comments until the presentation is finished. And if you're participating by webinar, you can submit questions or comments through the question pane in your control panel. I'll compile the questions and ask them after the presentation. You can access the question pane by clicking on the red arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And then at the end of the presentation, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill out our evaluation form, we're always interested in what you have to say. So let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Dr. Diana Chapkin. Dr. Chapkin is a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist who practices at Genesis Fertility and Reproductive Medicine in Brooklyn, New York. She's certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gyneco Gynecologists and has special interest in helping women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and in improving IVF protocols. She's also dedicated to offering options for fertility pr preservation, such as egg and embryo freezing for cancer patients. Dr. Chapkin completed her OBGYN residency and fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania and earned her medical degree from New York University. She's an active member of New York OB Society, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and is a fellow of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Welcome, Dr. Chapkin. We're very excited to have you here today. Thank you very much, Christine. It is a pleasure to be here, and I wanted to thank Cher uh, for inviting me to speak with you. Uh, my name is Diana Chapkin, and I am a physician who specializes in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, which is a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynecology. I work at Genesis, which is the fertility practice of Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. And there I am Director of Oncofertility, which is what I will be speaking with you about today. Particularly, I will be speaking about some of the options that patients with cancer can pursue in order to have children. I will discuss some of the treatments that are standard of care, and I will also discuss some of the experimental options. I will primarily focus on breast cancer, and I will explain why that is the case shortly. I will discuss the success rates for the procedures that we offer, as well as the success rates and the risks associated with pregnancy after cancer. At the end of this talk, I will briefly touch upon contraception in patients with cancer. The next slide. 
Sorry about that. The field of oncofertility is important for a number of reasons. Due to improvements in cancer care, disease can be diagnosed at earlier stages. And due to improvements in treatment, patients will survive longer than they had in the past. Currently, 130,000 reproductive age patients are diagnosed with cancer annually in the United States. Of these, 77% will survive for more than five years. This combined with delayed childbearing, with maternal age at first birth at an all-time high of 25 years, has created a situation in which many individuals are diagnosed and treated for cancer before they start their families. There have also been advances in reproductive medicine, which include improved fertility preservation options. The combination of these three factors has led to the development of the field of oncofertility, which is a combination of two fields, oncology, which is the field within medicine that studies and treats cancer, and fertility, which is a subfield of reproductive medicine, which helps women to conceive. This is a graph of the cancer incidence on mortality in women in the United States in 2010. So over 700,000 cases of cancer were diagnosed annually, and 10% were in reproductive age women. On the vertical axis is the number of patients, and in the horizontally is listed the types of cancer. In dark blue is the incidence, and light blue is the mortality. What you can see here is that breast, lung, and colon cancers are the most common cancers found in women. Breast cancer, as you can see, has one of the highest incidences with 13% of those cancers in reproductive age women, but one of the lowest mortality rates. This means that reproductive age women affected by breast cancer are one of the largest groups of women who can benefit from fertility preservation. Because women with breast cancer are one of the largest groups who might consider fertility preservation, I wanted to give some background on breast cancer and fertility. So breast cancer is the most common malignancy to affect women younger than age 45. 25,000 patients under age 45 are diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States annually. There are many women with breast cancer who are of reproductive age and addressing their concerns is a significant component of our work. Studies that assess the concerns of women with breast cancer have found that 57% of reproductive age women are concerned about their fertility, and 29% of the women felt that their concerns influenced their treatment plan. Not only are reproductive age women with breast cancer an important group to consider, but due to significant improvements in cancer therapies, many more children will survive cancer into adulthood. And so fertility issues may need to be addressed in this group as well. A report by the National Cancer Institute indicated that one out of 250 adults in 2015 will be a survivor of childhood cancer. There have been a number of survey studies performed to assess the concerns and opinions of survivors towards fertility issues. We know that approximately 75% of childless cancer survivors want children in the future. And adult survivors of childhood cancer report increased anxiety regarding finding a mate and are not prepared for long-term side effects of treatment. Overall, young men and women have equal concerns regarding fertility. But only 61% of women were informed of fertility preservation options at the time of their diagnosis. Because of the risks that cancer therapies pose on fertility, the American Society of Clinical Oncology first put out guidelines regarding this issue in 2006. They indicated that as part of informed consent prior to therapy, oncologists should address the possibility of infertility with patients 
as early in treatment planning as possible. This document is important in that it outlined the risks and options for fertility preservation. These guidelines were then revised most recently in 2013 to be even more specific and inclusive regarding risks and options for cancer patients and further emphasize the importance to oncologists as well as other healthcare providers who take care of cancer patients to address the possibility of infertility early on in the treatment planning process. I briefly would like to review some background on the female reproductive system as this is critical to understanding technologies that are offered to patients. A woman has eggs that are stored in her ovary. Once a month, an egg is released from the ovary and held in the fallopian tube. If the egg encounters a sperm there, then fertilization may occur and the woman can become pregnant. This whole process depends on hormones that are released by the brain and the ovary. This slide over here on the right depicts the coordination between the development of the egg and the hormones that are in a woman's body. The fertilized egg then becomes what is called an embryo. The embryo then grows in the uterus and develops into a fetus. This is a picture of the egg being picked up by the fallopian tube. If it is met by a sperm in the tube, then fertilization occurs and an embryo forms. But if fertilization fails to occur, then the egg and the lining of the uterus is lost through menstruation. This is a graph that depicts our current understanding of fertility in women. A woman's fertility depends on what we call ovarian reserve, which is the number and the quality of the eggs in her ovaries. The fewer the number of eggs in a woman's ovary, the less chance she will have of conceiving. A woman is born with all of the eggs she will ever, ever have, and over time the egg supply will decrease. On the vertical axis is the number of eggs in the ovaries, and on the horizontal axis is the different stages of a woman's life. What you can see here is that the maximum number of eggs a woman will ever have is when she is still herself a fetus at 20 weeks of development. By the time she's born, she will only have one million eggs left in her ovaries. She then will continue to lose eggs throughout her life, and by the time she reaches puberty, she will have 300,000 eggs remaining. She will then lose eggs over time through natural, cell loss, through natural cell loss and will also lose eggs with ovulation. By the time she reaches menopause, she will essentially have no eggs left. Different cancer therapies can accelerate this natural loss of eggs by causing damage to the eggs and to the ovary and can accelerate this ovarian aging. This means that a woman may run out of eggs earlier than she would have if she were not exposed to those cancer therapies. So for instance, a woman who may have reached menopause at age 50 may instead do so earlier if exposed to those therapies that significantly decrease her egg supply. So how, in fact, do cancer treatments harm the ovaries? Chemotherapy can cause egg depletion, ovarian failure, and chromosomal damage in the egg. And radiation can potentially affect the ovarian function and impair hormone production. These detrimental effects on the ovaries can occur at all ages, but women who are exposed later in life may be more affected than women who are exposed earlier in life. So we know that chemotherapy has an effect on the ovaries, but not all chemotherapeutic drugs have the same effects. Here is a list of drugs that are grouped and listed in order of increasing toxicity to the ovaries. You see here that drugs like cyclophosphamide, which are alkylating agents, are the most toxic to ovarian function. Encircled in red are the ones primarily used for breast cancer treatment. There are, in fact, very useful online resources that allow patients and clinicians to quickly access the level of risk for a given therapeutic regimen. This is a very uh, easy to use risk calculator, which is on the Fertile Hope website. You can basically type in the type of cancer and the different chemotherapeutic drugs that will be used and get valuable information regarding the risk to fertility. This can then be used in subsequent discussion with clinicians when planning treatment. So how does chemotherapy affect a woman's menstrual cycle? 
Usually during treatment, a woman does not get her period. Recovery of menses usually takes six months to one year. Return of menses does not necessarily imply return of fertility. And different regimens, as just discussed, have varying effects on the recovery of menses. And as I briefly touched upon, the younger a woman is at the time of exposure, the greater chance of recovery of normal menses. We know from studies that women who are younger than 35 when exposed to chemotherapy have a 90% chance of recovery of normal menses, while those who are 40 at the time of exposure will only have a 20% chance of recovery of normal menses. As I said, return of regular menses does not necessarily mean that fertility has returned to normal. Therefore, we need to assess fertility by other measure, measures, such as measuring hormone levels circulating throughout the body, as well as by performing a pelvic ultrasound, which allows us to visualize the ovary. Fertility depends on the complex interplay between hormones produced by the brain and the ovary and the eggs that develop in the ovary. This entire complex system needs to work well and to communicate efficiently. We assess how well this system is working, thereby assessing fertility, by measuring hormone levels with blood tests. Some of the most important ones are listed here on the left-hand side. We also evaluate the ovaries by performing an ultrasound, which allows us to measure the size of the ovaries and to count the number of follicles in the ovary. Follicles are small pockets of fluid that can be easily seen on ultrasound and contain the eggs, which can only be seen under the microscope. So chemotherapy and radiation can clearly affect menses during treatment and can sometimes affect subsequent fertility. But the risk to fertility is not only due to the potentially detrimental effects of the cancer treatment itself, but can be due to the time that is required to be on the treatments during which pregnancy is avoided. So as a woman gets older, we know that her fertility will decline and the rate of miscarriage will increase. This is a graph of the rate of fertility and miscarriage. What you see here is that as a woman ages, her fertility will decline while the rate of miscarriage will increase. This becomes significant when cancer treatments delays a woman's attempt to conceive. So as an example, tamoxifen is given to estrogen-positive breast cancer patients for about five to 10 years, during which time she's instructed not to conceive. This amount of time not conceiving may have the greatest impact on a woman's fertility and on her increased risk of miscarriage. Having recognized that current cancer treatments have the potential to cause damage to a woman's reproductive system, are there ways that we can modify treatment to prevent that damage or to limit that damage? And in fact, there are several, several ways. So for example, we can offer less aggressive resection for uterine, cervical, and ovarian cancers. We can plan radiation fields to the ovaries so that perhaps the radiation does not affect the ovaries as greatly as it would have if there was radiation directly to the ovaries. We can move the ovaries out of the radiation field prior to treatment with a procedure called transposition, and that's a surgical procedure during which the ovaries can be moved out of the radiation field. We can use chemotherapy drugs that are less toxic to the ovaries, so potentially using less alkylating agents and that would obviously be in discussion with the oncologist and, of course, taking into account success rates with those treatments. Modifying doses is important. And also timing of treatment. So specifically for breast cancer patients, chemotherapy can be delayed for one month in order to allow for, to, for, to, for fertility preservation to take place. Or in the case of tamoxifen, tamoxifen can often be delayed or a break in the middle of tamoxifen can be offered so that either pregnancy or fertility preservation can be done. But even after treatment modifications are made to lessen the risk, still there can be damage to the ovaries. So there are a number of things we could do to preserve fertility, which are often offered to patients uh, prior to cancer treatment. 
So I'm going to review the um, standard of care most often used options for fertility preservation. Embryo cryopreservation, or embryo freezing, is performed once the egg is fertilized and an embryo is formed, which is then frozen. This is the most common and the most successful type of fertility preservation option. Egg freezing is a process whereby eggs are removed from the ovary and frozen in the lab prior to fertilization, meaning prior to the formation of an embryo. The egg can then be thawed at a later point in time to allow for fertilization and for an embryo to develop. Sperm freezing is offered to men prior to chemotherapy or radiation. And there are experimental options, which include ovarian tissue freezing, which I will touch upon later. There are a number of things to consider when trying to figure out which fertility preservation option to pursue. So the age of the patient is important, because a woman would have had to be post-pubertal in order to undergo IVF to obtain eggs to freeze or to form embryos. The type of cancer and the treatment plan is important because sometimes there's not enough time for a patient to undergo the process of embryo or egg freezing. The presence of a partner or a sperm source which is needed in order to form an embryo for freezing has to be considered. And also the willingness to use donor gametes, meaning donor eggs or donor sperm. Also, the available time before cancer treatment may limit the type of options that are offered. The health of the patient needs to be considered, and often more than one option can be possible for a given patient. So as I said earlier, we can modify cancer treatments to a certain extent, but in some cases, chemotherapy and radiation can have detrimental effects on the ovary and the egg. So we look to solutions where we, can, where we can remove the eggs or portions of the ovary prior to treatment. After stimulation with hormones, we can take the egg out of the ovary and fertilize the egg immediately, which becomes an embryo, and then freeze the embryo, which can then be thawed and placed back into the uterus after treatment. Or we can freeze the egg, which can be thawed years after treatment and can then be fertilized with, with sperm once a partner or a sperm source is found. There are also experimental options where we can take the tissue and freeze the tissue from the ovary and theoretically obtain from this tissue eggs that can be fertilized at a later point in time. Or we can take that tissue that was frozen and transplant it back to a patient after their chemotherapy or radiation which allows a certain of that portion of that ovary to be protected from the chemotherapy or radiation since it's removed prior to exposure to those therapies. So we don't necessarily know who we should target for these treatments because we don't know who definitely will be affected. And so we try to offer this to all of our patients. All patients should be informed of the potential risks and options available. But it's important to remember that we do attempt to figure out who would best benefit from these therapies because, in fact, some technologies may pose some risk. These therapies may potentially delay cancer therapy and can be costly and invasive. <clears throat> In order to obtain eggs to freeze or to obtain eggs that can then be fertilized with sperm, to form embryos, we need to replicate the procedure that is employed during a traditional in vitro fertilization cycle. Typically, this process takes about two weeks. And in the case of women with a recent breast cancer diagnosis, the optimal time to, to, to perform this procedure is between surgery and the start of chemotherapy. We administer hormones to a woman for about 10 to 14 days. This allows the eggs in the ovary to mature and to develop. The goal is for as many eggs as possible to develop. The eggs are then removed from the ovary via a minimally invasive surgical procedure. The eggs are then either frozen and thawed for use at a later point in time, or can be placed directly in a dish where fertilization with the sperm occurs and an embryo is formed. The embryo can be frozen for extended periods of time, 
and can then be placed back into the uterus after cancer treatment. This process, in which the ovaries are stimulated to produce eggs that have the potential to be fertilized, can only be performed in girls who have already reached puberty. Prior to puberty, a girl's ovaries will not respond to hormones, and so this is not an option for them. And some of the potential risks include a delay in cancer therapy, high estrogen levels, ovarian hyperstimulation, theoretical thrombosis or clot risk, and the cost can range between five and $12,000 plus the cost of storage. But we'll talk about how that is not an issue for, for a lot of women. In vitro fertilization, or IVF, means fertilization of the egg in a test tube or in a dish rather than in the fallopian tube, which is what happens naturally. Here's a nice picture of the ovary with follicles, which are pockets of fluid that contain those microscopic eggs. And here you see the process where the sperm meets the egg and an embryo is formed. And then that embryo can be placed back into the uterus. And then hopefully a pregnancy results. This is a picture of the minimally invasive surgical procedure called the egg retrieval, which occurs after stimulation with hormones. You can see the ultrasound probe, which is placed in the vagina. It has a needle attached to it, which allows the ovary to be accessed. And the eggs are then removed from the follicles and given to the laboratory. In the laboratory, the embryologists, who are the scientists who work in an IVF lab, will mix the sperm and the egg together. Once the sperm penetrates the wall of the egg, fertilization is said to have occurred, and an embryo forms. The embryo is then placed back into the uterus in a traditional IVF cycle. But in fertility preservation cycles, the embryo is instead frozen for use at a later point in time. So this is a picture, of course, of the egg, of the, and this is the sperm. Fertilization occurs at this point genetic material from both the egg and the sperm. So embryo cryopreservation, or freezing, is our oldest and most established fertility preservation technique. The first birth from embryo freezing was in 1983. It does require about two weeks of ovarian stimulation, followed by the needle aspiration to collect the eggs. Eggs are then fertilized in vitro, meaning outside the body, and frozen for later use. Freezing is possible at different stages of embryo development. So here you see two of the different stages. This would be a cleavage stage or a day three, and this would be at a day five. And we can freeze at either stage. So how successful is embryo freezing? In fact, embryo freezing results in very good success rates. This is a table that summarizes the data from thousands of cycles in the United States in 2010. This is data taken from the National SART database, which collects information from IVF clinics throughout the country. This is for patients with infertility and not specifically in patients with cancer, however. What you see here, though, is that the chance of pregnancy after IVF with transfer of a fresh embryo, meaning prior to freezing, is about 20 to 50 percent overall, depending on the age of the patient. The chance of pregnancy, of course, will decline with increasing age. And what is circled in red is the chance of successful pregnancy and live birth when using frozen embryos. What you can see is that the chance of success is about 20 to 40 percent. The rates are very good, but they're slightly lower than when using fresh embryos. And this, too, will have a lower chance of success with increasing age. There are some specific issues with embryo cryopreservation. So embryo cryopreservation requires that a woman have a partner or a sperm donor in order to fertilize her eggs and form an embryo. It can also expose women to high levels of estrogen, although for a very short period of time. And this could potentially be an issue for some cancers, such as breast cancer, that may be stimulated by these high levels of estrogen. It also, as I mentioned before, requires that the woman has already reached puberty. And this process of stimulating the ovaries can take some time. It takes about two weeks. It can also delay treatment for other definitive procedures while this is being done. 
But in reality, as I mentioned, time should not be an issue, especially for breast cancer patients, because there is an optimal window during which they can undergo ovarian stimulation in between surgery and chemotherapy. Also, embryo cryopreservation can potentially be costly. So as opposed to embryo banking, which requires a male partner or a sperm source, egg banking offers women reproductive autonomy. Women can freeze their eggs, and then they can be thawed years later and be fertilized with a sperm to form an embryo in the lab, which can then be placed back into the uterus at a later point in time. So there is a clear benefit to offering egg freezing, especially to women who don't have a partner. <clears throat> the American Society of Reproductive Medicine put out a statement in 2012 that egg freezing need no longer be considered experimental. <clears throat> this procedure had previously been considered experimental because the success rates were not good enough to be offered a standard of care to patients. However, with advances in technology and greater accumulation of data, it has become clear that egg freezing should be considered standard of care. <coughs> in some studies, frozen eggs seem to be as good as fresh eggs in achieving pregnancies in young patients. Similar to the procedure that is used to obtain eggs during IVF, a woman needs to undergo approximately two weeks of daily hormone injections and the minimally, minimally invasive egg retrieval procedure is performed. Egg freezing is beneficial over embryo freezing in that no partner is needed, and therefore it allows for reproductive autonomy. And although the data so far indicates that frozen eggs and fresh eggs result in similar pregnancy rates for young women, Egg freezing may still have limitations, and the success rate may not be as good for all patients when compared to embryo freezing. So this is some of the background on egg freezing. The first human pregnancy from egg freezing was in 1986, which is only shortly after the first pregnancy from embryo freezing. However, this technology had not really taken off to the degree that embryo freezing had, and that's primarily because of the lower chance of initial success. The early results had been disappointing with poor egg survival, fertilization, and pregnancy rates. Partially, this was due to the use of the slow freeze method, in which the eggs were frozen in a programmed slow manner as opposed to the vitrification method in which the eggs are frozen immediately in a flash freeze process. This latter method is thought to help to avoid the formation of ice crystals and damage to the egg. So why are eggs more difficult to freeze than embryos? Well, eggs have a large cell size. They also have a very high water content with ice crystal formation once that water freezes. There's a potential for chromosomal damage, especially if ice crystals form. And there's hardening of the zona pellucida, which is a shell outside of the egg, and that can affect fertilization. But again, the use of vitrification has really allowed us to avoid some of these issues. This is a graph that illustrates the number of births that resulted from the slow freeze and the vitrification of eggs. Because remember, at the beginning of egg freezing, really only slow freeze method was performed. You can see that between 1997 and 2008, the number of births from slow freeze and vitrification method had increased dramatically with a total of about 1,000 births nationally from this technology as of 2008. You can also see that the number of live births from vitrification has increased over the past few years and has exceeded the number of births born from slow freeze. And currently, the vitrification method is the preferred technology for egg freezing because it's thought to lead to greater success when compared to the slow freeze. So what are the chances of success with egg freezing? So take a woman who is 28 years old who has six eggs retrieved. 
If an egg is fertilized immediately and an embryo is formed and then placed back into the uterus, the chance of pregnancy is about 40 to 50 percent. And that's based on the embryo data that I just recently showed you in that table. But if the egg is vitrified or flash frozen and fertilized later, recent data shows us that there is a similar chance of pregnancy. But again, this data was done in, in young women, and that's why I chose 28 as the, as the patient here. If the egg is slow frozen and fertilized later, there is somewhat of a less chance of pregnancy, which is why vitrification is the method often used. So we know that egg freezing with subsequent thawing and formation of embryos results in pregnancies at a good rate. But the question that needs to be addressed is, is this technology safe? Do babies born from frozen eggs have a higher rate of birth defects than the general population? And in fact, the study was done where they looked at close to 1,000 babies born from egg freezing and looked at the rate of birth defects. They compared this to the rate of birth defects in the general population and found that the rates were, in fact, similar. So based on this data, it is thought that egg freezing is safe. Ovarian simulation to get eggs to freeze or to form embryos in cancer patients raises specific issues. So a rapid team approach is needed with coordination between oncologists and fertility specialists. The hormones that are used to stimulate the ovaries in order to obtain eggs can theoretically also stimulate certain breast and uterine cancers to grow. However, medications such as letrozole and tamoxifen can decrease circulating levels of these hormones. And using these medications during the stimulation period does not decrease the chance of success or the number of eggs retrieved. Now I will briefly speak about some of the specific treatment issues related to breast cancer and where fertility preservation options can be considered. So early breast cancer is treated with surgery, meaning a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, and some women will need chemotherapy. For this group, the best time to offer fertility preservation would be between surgery and chemotherapy. Usually there is a one-month time period during which they will need to wait for chemo, so that's the optimal time to undergo hormonal stimulation to obtain eggs. During chemotherapy, which is about a four- to six-month time period, fertility interventions are not performed. If chemo is not administered, then the patient will go straight to radiation therapy from surgery. Radiation therapy takes about four to six weeks, and during this time period, women are instructed not to undergo fertility interventions or to become pregnant. And if they are HER2 positive, they will be treated with Herceptin for one year directly after radiation. During this time period, they also should not undergo fertility treatment or become pregnant. <clears throat> If a woman has an estrogen-sensitive breast cancer, then tamoxifen treatment is administered typically for about a five to 10-year time period. And tamoxifen has been shown to be effective at reducing recurrence and in improving survival in patients with estrogen-positive breast cancer because it blocks the ability of the breast tissue be, to be stimulated by estrogen. However, during the tamoxifen treatment course, which is about five to 10 years, a patient is instructed not to conceive. And five to 10 years is a very long period of time, especially when considering a patient's fertility. However, there is now good evidence that a patient can delay tamoxifen treatment to become pregnant or can take a break during the treatment course, of tre during the treatment course to allow for fertility preservation or to become pregnant. So there are multiple points in time where fertility preservation um, can occur for women with breast cancer. But the optimal thing is to refer early, refer as soon as uh, diagnosis, so that all of these different options uh, can be offered. 
As I mentioned, the hormones that we give women to stimulate their eggs to develop can result in high levels of estrogen, which may stimulate certain cancers to grow. So there is effort to figure out whether or not fertility preservation can be done without any hormonal stimulation. And the answer is yes. These are methods which I will touch upon in a few moments, but they are primarily experimental. This means that they can only be offered under a research protocol and are not widely offered to all patients as standard methods of fertility preservation. However, since prepubertal girls have ovaries that will not respond to hormonal stimulation, these experimental methods are the only ones that can be offered to prepubertal girls. So pregnancy itself, regardless of whether or not it occurred as a result of IVF, will cause an increase in estrogen levels. And so there is a concern that these high estrogen levels will worsen or increase the risk of cancers, such as breast cancer, that may be stimulated by estrogen. And there have been multiple studies aimed at trying to assess whether or not pregnancy after breast cancer increases the chance of cancer recurrence. But these studies have in fact found that the answer is no. Studies have shown that women who become pregnant after breast cancer do not have an increased risk for disease recurrence or for poor survival. And in at least two studies indicated that pregnancy is in fact protective against disease recurrence. It's hard to know exactly why this might be the case, but at least we do know that pregnancy after breast cancer does not worsen prognosis. So we know that pregnancy will not increase the risk of breast cancer recurrence in survivors. But another important question to address is whether or not the pregnancy itself is at greater risk in those who are cancer survivors. In general, there is no increased risk of congenital malformations, genetic diseases, or cancer in children of cancer survivors. However, there's a possible risk, including miscarriage or an increased risk of birth defects, if conceived within the, three, the first three months after chemotherapy. However, this data is taken directly from animal studies and does not necessarily mean the same thing in humans. We do not have this data in humans. But still, based on this information, the recommendation is to wait three months after completion of chemotherapy before becoming pregnant. But also it's important to remember that with increasing age, there is an increased risk of miscarriage. And some of the therapies used to treat cancer may push off when a woman would be able to conceive. And this advanced age itself may put her at an increased risk of miscarriage. <clears throat> so women who have cancer sometimes carry genes that predispose them to develop those cancers. An understandable and common concern among survivors then is that they do not want to transmit these genes to their offspring. In fact, our embryologists can do a procedure in the lab called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which allows us to analyze for potentially cancer-causing genes in embryos and only put back or freeze for later placements those embryos that are not affected by those abnormal genes. And here is a list of only some of the genetic cancers that can be tested for. Here's a really amazing picture of an embryo that consists of many cells, and a portion of the embryo here is being removed under the microscope so that the genetic material, which is representative of the genetic material in the rest of the embryo, 
can be analyzed and evaluated for genetic defects. What about pregnancy after cancer? So certain therapies will have different effects. Some women may have their ovarian reserve or their egg supply affected in such a way so that they are not able to become pregnant after cancer therapies and may not respond to fertility treatments. Some of these women may consider the donor egg process in which an egg is taken via IVF from a woman with a good ovarian reserve, and after fertilization of this egg, the embryo can be placed in the uterus of the cancer survivor. Now, this has some of the highest success rates of all fertility treatment options. On the other hand, some cancer survivors may in fact be able to conceive with their own eggs, but they may not be healthy enough to carry a pregnancy because of the significant toxicities caused by the chemotherapeutic medications. For example, adriamycin can have an effect on the heart, and so it's important to assess the heart prior to conceiving because pregnancy can potentially pose additional stress. It's also important to get an evaluation by a doctor who specializes in taking care of women who are considered high risk, otherwise known as maternal fetal medicine specialists. And this is done prior to conception in order to assess the health of the woman prior to becoming pregnant. In addition, some women may be too ill to carry a pregnancy after therapy or may have their uterus removed or may have had significant radiation therapy to the uterus, which may make it unsafe to carry a pregnancy. And so surrogacy may need to be considered in these individuals. For those considering surrogacy, legal consultation is needed, and one has to consider the cost and that paid surrogacy is not currently legal in all states. Now I will briefly discuss some of the fertility preservation techniques that are at this time considered experimental or investigational. So as I alluded to before, there are some patients who will not be able to be exposed to hormonal therapy, and there are some that will need to undergo chemotherapy or radiation right away, and will not have the two weeks required to undergo hormonal stimulation during an IVF cycle. So with these investigational techniques, the idea is that you remove a portion of the ovarian tissue prior to chemotherapy or radiation. You could then transplant that tissue back after the therapy and hope that it is functional and can develop eggs. Or you can remove a portion of the ovarian tissue and try to remove eggs from that tissue so that fertilization could occur later on. So with ovarian tissue banking, no ovarian stimulation is needed, there is a minimal delay in treatment, no partner is needed, and as I mentioned, it is the only option in prepubertal girls. Autologous transplantation, meaning that a portion of the ovary is placed back into the individual from which it came, can be performed as well. Currently, there are 25 human births to date from this procedure. There is a risk of receding cancer cells, especially in cancers that may involve the ovaries, such as hematologic, ovarian, and breast cancers. And again, repeat surgeries is required, so you need one surgery to remove a portion of the tissue and then another surgery to place back that tissue into the ovary. Follicle maturation in vitro is a process whereby the tissue is taken in the lab and technicians will try to remove the follicles or the eggs from that tissue and then potentially freeze them for later on or fertilize them right away 
and then form an embryo and then potentially freeze the embryo or place that embryo back. And this has been one of the greatest focuses of the Oncofertility Consortium um, based at Northwestern in Chicago, of which uh, Genesis and myself are a part of, um, as it would yield a really great benefit, especially to prepubertal girls. And again, it would avoid the need to undergo two weeks of hormonal stimulation. Um, but as of yet, no human births um, um, have developed from this procedure at this time. So it's a lot easier, I'm going to just move on to men here for a few moments. Um, so it's a lot easier for men to freeze sperm than it is for women to freeze eggs. Men do not have to undergo hormonal stimulation, nor do they need any surgical procedures to collect sperm. They just need to collect sperm via ejaculation into a sterile container. So all men should be given the opportunity to bank sperm before cancer treatment. Boys who have started sexual development should be offered this option. So for instance, a boy who is around the age of puberty but who has not yet fully completed puberty should still be given this option to attempt collection. But a boy who is tre truly prepubertal um, there's no option to preserve fertility currently in these boys. It's important to try to obtain adequate volume of semen. However, any amount of sperm that is produced should be frozen uh, for um, potential uh, fertility preservation. And infectious disease screening based on FDA guidelines should be offered. So as I mentioned, I work at Genesis, based in Brooklyn, where we offer fertility preservation for men and women with and without cancer. We have significant experience and good success offering this service. In 2012, we froze 230 embryos in about 111 cycles and froze 189 samples of sperm. These, of course, were not all in individuals with cancer. Between 2006 and 2014, we froze 150 eggs for 20 patients. And between 2011 and 2014, we performed nine embryo transfers from previously frozen eggs, and four of those transfers resulted in pregnancies. Now, most of the women for whom we froze eggs have not yet come back to use them. And again, these numbers consist of patients with and without cancer. This is a graph of the pregnancy rates for IVF nationally in 2011. This is for patients with infertility and not specifically for patients with cancer. Now in light blue is the percent of those cycles that resulted in pregnancy, and in green is the percent that became pregnant with twins, and in orange is the percent that were pregnant with triplets. And you can see overall with increasing age, there's a decreased chance of pregnancy. And these are the success rates at Genesis where our pregnancy rates are higher than national averages in some age groups. So even though IVF, frozen embryo transfer cycles, and egg freezing cycles are very successful, there are many individuals who do not pursue these treatments. One recent survey found that typically only 2 to 4% of eligible women pursue fertility preservation. And only 47% of oncologists routinely refer patients to a reproductive endocrinologist. So we're still trying to figure out why more people do not pursue these treatments. One of the reasons, if not the most important reason, has to do with cost. So what you see here are some of the treatments that we provide in the left-hand column. In the middle column are some of the average costs. 
And the right-hand side is Sharing Hope class. So Sharing Hope is a program that offers scholarships and um, reduced costs for these procedures for individuals with cancer. There are many programs um, that offer even further reduced prices for individuals with cancer. So for instance, at Genesis, we actually offer free egg freezing for any woman with a cancer diagnosis. So we offer one free egg freezing cycle for, for women for that. Um, So just to go over some of the ways to, sh to cover costs, so the Sharing Hope program works with REI practices to reduce this cost to eligible patients, and most patients with a cancer diagnosis are eligible for this. Uh, many programs offer free medications. Um, in fact, there are many uh, pharmacies and programs that will give medications completely free, and medications really is a big uh, part of the cost in an IVF process. Insurance coverage is highly variable and it's worth appealing and many programs, including at Genesis, we do work with insurance companies to try to get coverage for this. Um, but again, even when insurance coverage isn't covering it, we do offer flexible strategies like um, sliding scale and often just uh, free of charge uh, for these uh, processes. So there are many free patient resources available online that can help patients learn more about the effects of the treatments and the different ways that modifications can be made. So myuncofertility.org is just one example um, of, of a site where you can go and get really great resources for patients and for clinicians. So this is an example of a great resource um, that's available on myunclefertility.org. Um, and there are lots of apps that contain these resources as well. So this is a worksheet uh, which prompts patients to ask their oncologist to discuss specific questions with them at the time of their consultation. And patients may not initially think of these questions on their own, so just having it on an app or printed out ahead of time uh, can be very, very helpful. So just to summarize some of the options. So the established fertility preservation options are ones that are considered standard of care. Embryo freezing, egg freezing, conservative surgery, and sperm freezing. Some of the experimental include ovarian tissue freezing with either subsequent transplantation of that tissue back to the ovary or subsequent retrieval of follicles in the lab from that tissue. Other options include adoption, egg donation, and surrogacy. Future directions. So there needs to be increased need for advocacy and awareness. So unfortunately, many patients only learn about their options for, for preserving fertility after cancer therapy. And the decision-making process. Only 30% of those who present for an oncofertility consultation pursue treatment. And there's ongoing effort to figure out why that's the case. So some crucial take-home points that I really would like you to walk away with. So number one, fertility treatments and pregnancy do not worsen cancer prognosis. Prior treatment with chemotherapy or radiation has not been shown to cause birth defects in offspring. There are multiple options to ease the cost associated with fertility preservation for patients with cancer. And so now I'm just going to shift gears just for um, the last portion. I just want to touch upon contraception very quickly. So it's extremely important to consider contraception for all reproductive aged women undergoing cancer treatment. Contraception should be offered to all reproductively aged patients undergoing cancer treatment. 
Irregular cycles or lack of menses during treatment does not necessarily mean that a woman cannot conceive. Pregnancy during cancer treatment may alter the course of the disease. And cancer treatment during pregnancy can affect the pregnancy. And so there are many methods that are non-hormonal and long-acting, and that should be considered based on diagnosis. So specifically, if women are diagnosed with hormonally responsive breast cancer, then they should stick to non-hormonal forms of contraception, which include the copper IUD or barrier methods of contraception. So I consider it a great privilege to be part of this important work, and to do this requires a team of smart, talented, and compassionate people. Listed here are the wonderful group of individuals that I work with at Genesis, and I wanted to acknowledge them here. I don't know if it's coming out on this slide so well. Um, but in the background, you could see our thank you notes and cards from patients. And again, I thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. How long do the embryos so there's no known limit of time on that. Whether it's frozen, no, no, frozen is frozen. Yes, exactly. If it's, mm -hmm, if it's frozen for a month versus frozen for a year versus five years or six years, there's no evidence that the amount of time being frozen has an effect on the subsequent success in terms of achieving a pregnancy. And you mentioned a lot of people that have frozen embryos, but a lot of them haven't come back for them. They're still Frozen? Or frozen eggs, frozen embryos, yeah, same thing. Mm -hmm. What's with that? Because what do you find? People don't want them or they didn't survive their cancer? Or right. Well, specifically I mentioned that in terms of the frozen eggs, um, just because right now in terms of you know giving numbers of success for frozen eggs, it's only something that's really been done in the past few years. So it just happens to be that patients who have recently froze their eggs in the past few years have not felt that they are ready to come back for those frozen eggs just yet. Okay. That, 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 that was why I mentioned that. Okay. And to um, simulate the eggs if you have breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, and you shouldn't use hormonal methods, I guess, to simulate the eggs, uh, so what is done today? Right. So all of this is 100% done in conjunction and consultation with the oncologist um, because things often are not necessarily black and white. Um, but often times what we do, even if in an estrogen sensitive breast cancer, we'll offer medications such as letrozole and tamoxifen during that stimulation period. So that, because when we give women hormones, we give hormones to stimulate the ovaries, we're not giving estrogen, we're giving other hormones produced by the brain that stimulate the ovaries. The ovaries then go on to produce follicles, produce those eggs, and the ovary produces estrogen. So that estrogen is not required for the stimulation process. That estrogen is sort of a byproduct of this whole process. So we can easily use medications that just block the estrogen so that the brain, the breast doesn't see the estrogen, and that doesn't affect the stimulation or the development of the eggs in the ovary. And medications would include things like letrozole or tamoxifen. I think that's one of the biggest fears that women have yeah. is that if they were to stimulate, that yeah. that would therefore. I think that just. Yeah. I don't know if that information is not being told, not being heard. People are too afraid. It's just. Well, there's more and more studies and more and more data being collected on that, and I think we're just sort of at the beginning of really gathering that information. I mean, the truth is that you need prospective randomized control studies to really give you a definitive answer. And so, so far, we don't have that, and I don't, I don't know that that sort of study is really ever going to be done. But tons of retrospective data, tons of collections on case studies, reports, on just kind of epidemiologic data has shown us that it does not have an effect, and that also using medications like that do not decrease the chance of pregnancy, do not decrease the chance of success, and do not increase the chance of, of breast cancer in the data that we have. So, I mean, I do, I agree with you. I think that it is very important that that data gets 
disseminated and that people know more about it um, because I think that fear does prevent women from from moving forward. And in addition to cost, I think that's probably right up there with one of the reasons why people go for these consultations, but they have other fears, they have other concerns. So the studies that were done, do the studies differentiate between different types of cancer? Right. No, I, I don't think the numbers are big enough to really different differentiate. I mean, I think when they look at the groups, they look at breast cancer, and they're not getting, you know, then there are also so many subtypes of breast cancer that they don't Right, so that's really hard. Right. So if, you know, someone's triple negative. Right, they wouldn't have had the power. They wouldn't have had enough numbers in order to say anything definitive about that. And the truth is that even if they didn't have um, a true difference, there, was, there probably wasn't enough um, power to say that that no difference really meant anything. But again, that's why it comes down to talking to the oncologist, and a lot of this has to do with professional opinion and um, and comfort with proceeding. But many more oncologists, more and more, are accepting this as as safe. And again, it has to do with being able to block that estrogen. As long as the breast tissue doesn't see the estrogen, there should not be an effect on on, on affecting survival or, or recurrence. So I'm not sure if um, people on the on the, the webinar are not getting any questions. I'm not sure if you're able to submit questions. So I can try to unmute. I can try to unmute you so that you can actually speak. So let me try to do that. Children after. Children after. Um. But it's the question and answer period, so I really can't quit. So if, if you're uh, on the webinar right now, I've just unmuted everybody. So you have the option to I ask I, I have a date with late. Bernadette uh, Slavin. We're going on a bus trip up to the Culinary Institute of America. So it's a, yeah, yum is right. And I have been. I think I just muted her. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so if anyone else would like to ask a question, I believe you're unmuted, but I'm not sure. Give me a sign. Jane, are you there? I'm not sure. Um, so I have a couple of questions. So um, can you talk a little bit more about the evidence that talks about the fact that tamoxifen, tamoxifen could be delayed? Sure, sure. So there is um, some recent data on that, um, on either delaying tamoxifen, the before kind of starting treatment to allow for a month to do fertility preservation, or also um, in the time period. So, you know, now most recently oncologists are telling patients to go on tamoxifen for 10 years. And so because of that, there's been a lot of effort to try to figure out, can you take a break? And so, I mean, these are kind of retrospective studies that really look back rather than prospective studies. But they have found that taking a break with tamoxifen after about a two-year time period um, does allow allows for fertility preservation and also does not worsen prognosis and does not worsen recurrence. Okay. So, so in your professional opinion, mm -hmm. the best time to freeze eggs or to bank eggs or whatever is between surgery and chemotherapy. Yes. Yes. And that's why and that's why referral early is great because then you can coordinate that. And sometimes um, if you refer early, you can coordinate it in such a way that you can do one or two cycles. So it doesn't have to be just limited to one cycle. You can squeeze in perhaps two cycles of egg freezing. Because with every cycle with egg freezing, you get a certain number of eggs. If you do two cycles, you get potentially double that number. Um, and so the more eggs you have frozen, the better chance you have of subsequent pregnancy. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, and that would be the best time because there really that that really isn't a delay in treatment, right? So oftentimes there is just a month anyhow between surgery and chemotherapy that women are told to wait, whether they're going to do fertility preservation or not. Um, all the other options of fertility preservation are really requiring that you take a delay or you push off treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I happen to know that Jen here has some experience with surrogacy and a lot of information about surrogacy. So um, you, you probably told me this before, but I really wasn't aware that it's not legal in all states, mm -hmm. which could be problematic, right? Well, unfortunately, we live in New York, and it's not legal here. But it is um, it's only illegal in five states. It's only five states where it's completely discouraged. The rest of the states are. You know, they, they vary in law in the, in the case law as to what is safest for parents that are looking to have a surrogate in that state give birth. But unfortunately, New York and New Jersey are two of the ones that it is not recommended. Um, yes, I'm, I'm an ovarian cancer survivor and lost my ability to, I wasn't able to preserve, unfortunately. And I'm so inspired by those conversations because that was a conversation that I was unable to have. Um, so I think the, the preservation um, steps that are being taken now are, are wonderful because I was diagnosed 10 years ago and that conversation just didn't even exist. Um, so for me, I needed to look into other methods and um, needed an egg donor and a surrogate to have my son. Um, so I, I've come to learn a lot about surrogacy and I'm doing some work actually for the agency that we use. So if anyone has any questions or wants any information about that, I'm happy to share. Why don't you tell us your email address so people can get in touch with you if they want. Sure. It's J Rachman, R-A-C-H-M-A-N, at circlesurrogacy.com. Thank you. Great. I mean, I would say I can leave my email address as well if anyone has yeah, questions yeah. for me. Um, so it's dchafkin at genesisfertility.com. So it's D-C-H-A-V. K I N at genesisfertility.com in case questions come to you later. Happy to answer them. And I was also wondering too about frozen embryos. Yes. Um, so they could be frozen for quite some time. Yep. And the options down the road, um, mm -hmm. if you don't go the surrogacy road uh, mm -hmm. for implantation, is there something that people have options to be with on the app? or they've been frozen for a number of years? You mean if they decide that they don't want to use them? Mm -hmm. Right. So there are a number of things, and we actually speak with our patients quite in depth about this beforehand, and we have them think about it and let us know what they want to do with the embryos if they uh, decide not to use them. I mean, they can donate them, so there's embryo donation programs, and there's also people can decide to discard the embryos. We'll do that as well. And have there been any steps on the longest frozen embryo last year? No, no. I mean, it's years, years. Yeah. The actual time is okay. not aware. So, just kind of a general conversation. So, sure. so in your own particular practice, just your practice. Mm -hmm. um, have, do you have many cancer patients? So we have a few. Um, we do. We see cancer patients. I mean, like I said, I think that our statistics are pretty similar to the national average and that we have a number of women who come to speak with us and get the information. Um, but again, I would say probably 30% or so go on to fertility preservation afterwards. Um, and again, I think that you know, just having the conversation with patients, letting them know that that option is available can sometimes be the best part of this whole thing. I think that, you know, having someone talk to you about your future years and years down the road um, can just be kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, when oncologists and everyone else is talking to you about survival and, you know, is this chemotherapy going to work and you're kind of hit over the head with all this doom and gloom, and then to have someone talk to you about pregnancy, babies, years down the road, what do you want to do with your embryos later on, that kind of thing. I mean, I think that it just um, offers some, some semblance of hope. 
um, to these women. So I mean, I find that that is an extremely valuable um, part of the process, and I really enjoy being part of that. So yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there's lots of effort to try to figure out how do we make this more accessible? How do we make sure that patients get referred early? How do we make sure that cost is less of an issue? And how to increase that number from 30% to 90 or 95%. But other than that, I think just having the consultation and having the discussion is a huge um, like emotional benefit. You were talking a lot about um, prepubescent mm -hmm. children, yeah. right? So I like, so I'm assuming people that are young children that are going through mm -hmm. cancer treatment or about to go through cancer treatment. And probably fertility is not very high. Right. On right. Well, their radar, these kids have right? no idea. Right. Mm -hmm. But it may be on the parents' radar. Yeah. So you know, so I wonder how many of those conversations right. are actually occurring. Right. It's a very interesting thing, interesting that you brought it up. I mean, there is, surprisingly, there's a lot of um, pushback even with boys to freeze sperm. And that, that's surprising to me, and that's really one of our biggest efforts, and that's one of the biggest things I've been involved in in the past year to try to make it an easier conversation and really just part of the routine of something that the nurses and the oncologists bring up um, to the parents and to the patients right away. Um, because that is just an issue of being comfortable versus not being comfortable. And, and I don't think that that really should be an impediment. The issue with prepubertal girls, I mean, that's an issue. That has to do with freezing tissue in, in young girls. We don't really have as much we don't have very much data, right, because that's why it's still experimental, so it's not standard of care. So that, understandably, is kind of up in the air a little bit more with prepubertal girls. But with prepubertal boys, it comes down to being able to have a discussion and being comfortable talking about it. Um, and so I think we're getting better and better at it. Um, we've made great strides at Maimonides with the cancer center there in terms of being able to uh, offer sperm freezing for young boys, and I'm, I'm really, really proud of that. How invasive is the procedure for women? For the egg retrieval procedure? Yeah. Um, not very invasive at all. I mean, it's pretty, pretty routine. It's a 20-minute procedure. So women are asleep generally for this procedure, um, but kind of mild anesthesia. They're not intubated for this. Um, and um, basically an ultrasound probe is placed in the vagina, so it's a transvaginal ultrasound. And there's a very thin needle that's attached to the top of the ultrasound probe, so it's not any more than they would be used to when they do monitoring. So when we do monitoring before this procedure, we'll do transvaginal ultrasounds to assess the growth of the follicles, you know, during uh, prior visits. In any case, but they're asleep for this procedure because we're placing a needle uh, through the vaginal wall, but a very, very thin needle, and that pierces the ovary and um, aspirates the fluid from the follicles from the ovary, and it's all done via ultrasound guidance. So there's no incisions, um, you know, Yes, I mean, potentially this can be done awake, and in some cases we do it awake if there's one or two follicles, and that's in a separate um, sort of thing. I mean, for women with cancer, we, if there are multiple follicles, multiple eggs, and we'll do, um, we'll do this when they're asleep. But in terms of it being invasive, I mean, really that picture that I had up there, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and it's quick. And it's quick, and people feel fine afterwards. Um, there's a little bit of cramping, but there's not bleeding, you know. Um, and then when we form the embryos, we freeze the embryos, and then when we put back the embryos, I mean, that procedure, the women are completely awake. It's, um, you know, we place a speculum in the vagina and just put a catheter into the cervix, but there's really no um, cramping or discomfort or pain with that procedure. Well, thank you. This is really very informative and really interesting. Great. You know, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. I'm, I'm really not sure what's happening. You know, usually we get bombarded with questions, so I, I think there may be some issue with why people are unable to submit questions. But um, they have your email address. I yeah. I don't get bombarded by <laughs> hundreds I'm happy of questions. Happy to answer questions. Yeah. Great. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, I think it was, it was really, you did a really good, nice, thorough overview. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you information. My pleasure. Yeah, the information on the contraception was interesting. You know, all about that. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So um, people on the webinar, if you wouldn't mind 
at just filling out the evaluation. It should pop up after we close out here. And, um, and again, thank you, Dr. Chapkin. Really wonderful presentation. Hey, thank really you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>